So thanks everybody for inviting us to present to you about Nexon. Um, given the massive disruption that we're seeing in the entertainment industry right now, I'd like to start with some comments on the larger picture. Um, how the world is changing and how this could impact games industry and your investment strategies. Um, this photo is from a picture from uh, the movie 1917, which came out in the last 12 months. It's a, if you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic movie. But, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what's been going on in the world right now, and it, the echoes are, are pretty interesting. You know, 100 years ago, the world was struggling with massive transition compounded by a global pandemic. And in many respects, World War I was a manifestation of the Industrial Revolution. It started, that the war started with horses and swords and hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it quickly evolved or devolved into a war of machines, tanks, airplanes, um, explosive artillery. The changes started slowly, and then they accelerated very quickly. And the shock of that transition was very rough on the people who, were, who had to live through it. And it brings to mind the work of this man, if you can see this picture, uh, Daniel Kahneman. Um, Kahneman is a psychologist and he studied the errors in human perception, which leads to bad judgment. And he ended up inventing a new branch of economics focused on human behavior. And one of his key lessons was about recency bias, which is the habit of humans to assume that things we believe today are gonna remain true tomorrow. And Kahneman noted that a particularly dangerous component of this, this bias is that people notice changes very slowly at first and then very quickly, usually after it's too late. Today we're, mis we're witnessing massive destruction and disruption of some usually very stable industries, the airline industry, theme parks, professional sports, just, just to name three. And my job as a CEO is to make sure that, that 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 doesn't happen to my industry and, and in particular my company and to navigate us through those sorts of changes. And it's also importantly to help investors understand how we thrive uh, in times of great change. So how does Kahneman's research help us predict change in the entertainment industry in the COVID-19 era? Uh, we, to start, we should assume that change will happen slowly at first and then will happen quickly. So for instance, streaming services are enjoying big spikes in viewership right now. But what will happen when the production shock, the disruption of their ability to create new films and televisions runs headlong into demand? So a bit like World War I, COVID is exposing the difference and weaknesses and strengths of the different forms of entertainment. It was a lot harder to see them before COVID. Now, we've been observing slowly at first and then are now accelerating rapidly is the shift from offline to online from linear entertainment to fully interactive entertainment and especially to deep entertaining experiences in an online world now this of course is not a recent trend uh, the shift has just hadn't really sunk in until COVID. the center of the entertainment industry at least in terms of growth profit and innovation it's not hollywood and you could argue that it's not even in the US. Games is already a lot bigger uh, than linear entertainment. It's growing at three times the rate and it's a lot more profitable than, than linear entertainment. But what you read about in the press is much more focused on linear than it is on interactive entertainment. And much of the biggest and the most exciting innovation is coming out of Asia. Nexon invented the online MMORPG with Kingdom of the Winds in the mid 90s. And it invented the first free to play game with Quiz Quiz. Not long after that, Dungeon Fighter, which is our largest franchise today, uh, launched. And when I show the people this graph, they're, they're usually quite shocked and surprised. DNF is a bigger franchise than Star Wars in terms of life to date revenue. So if you take box office life to date of Star Wars, which launched in 1977 when I was in the fourth grade, um, and you compare gross revenue of uh, Dungeon Fighter, you just compare those two, Dungeon Fighter is several billion dollars bigger in terms of life to date uh, gross revenue. Now I'm putting aside lunch boxes and, uh, and t-shirts and all the ancillary license uh, uh, items just to compare apples to apples, but it's pretty astounding. Um, 
And it's one of the many data points that we could show you around the industry to show you how fundamental the shift to interactive entertainment into deeply immersive worlds uh, is. So what I'm pointing out to you is that we're living in an entirely new entertainment world already. And it looks very little like the old world. And I'm also pointing out that the shift seems slow at first, and then it seems very, very quick. So let's spend a minute to talk about the drivers. What's driving this new entertainment industry in this, in this new world that we're living in? Now, there's a lot of factors that we could talk about, but I'm gonna focus on four, and I'm gonna move through each one of them pretty rapidly. The first is that you have to understand that we're not making anything like a movie. A movie is a linear experience. Um, what we're making is, is a lot more like a virtual theme park. It's kind of like a virtual Disneyland. Uh, but it's, it's different than, than a theme park in two very important ways. First, our theme park is a virtual world that you live in. It's an incredibly immersive and rich experience. You can play it with a community of friends. You can work and collaborate closely with that community of friends together or you can compete against them. Even though in the physical world, you are socially distanced. You may be on the other side of the planet. That's a lot different, obviously, than Disneyland. Second, this virtual world, this virtual theme park is in your pocket. You can take it out. You don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to stay in anybody's hotel. You don't have to do what my dad did when I was a kid, which is put all the kids in a station wagon and drive down to Anaheim and, and do all that. You can just pull it out of your pocket and play it anytime you feel the urge to do that. And since it's all software, we can keep building and growing out this virtual playland forever. I'm gonna work on my, uh, my skills here with my cursor here. Um, second, because our content is completely virtual, it's oblivious to shocks that are happening in the physical world. You can consume our content anywhere and anytime. You don't have to go get on a plane. You don't have to go to a theater, as I was just saying. And importantly, that's on the demand side. The supply side, our developers can make it anywhere and any time. So not only is there not a demand shock in our business, there's not a supply shock. We have virtual teams all over the world that are making content right now, as I'm speaking to you, they're making their con content in their pajamas. Now, why are we ex experiencing so few reductions in productivity? We were already making content in our pajamas in our business. Now let's contrast that to Hollywood. Brad Pitt is, is currently unemployed as an actor. He's not making content in his pajamas. Uh, they need to go, uh, he and the other actors need to go to a place and to collect together in, in order to make a movie. Our games are showing that there's neither demand shock nor is there a supply shock. And it, the reason is, is because we're just simply not dependent on the physical world to, to deliver and consume our content. Okay, so the third big driver of this new world. Unlike traditional media, like movies or music, every generation of new technology opens up a massive new growth path for games. In music, each new format, from vinyl discs to tapes, to CDs to streaming, these are all things that I experienced over my lifetime. They essentially replaced the old format and it didn't drive new growth. You can see this if you look through the numbers. Now, I grew, it, I, it, it, at the same time I grew up playing, uh, starting out playing video games in arcades. Then came an Apple II, then came consoles, then came the internet, and, and then came social media and smartphones. Each wave of technology that came into the video games business represented an, literally an order of magnitude increase in the size of the market because it increased the, uh, it was an order of magnitude size increase in number of gamers. Um, so that's very, very different than other forms of linear, than, than linear entertainment. Today, we're now looking at smartphones with networking and GPUs so sophisticated that just five years ago, they would have been called workstations. That means that Nexon's market uh, for online virtual worlds has grown from a few hundred million PCs around the world, which is where we started, to several billion smartphones around the world. So that's an order of magnitude increase. Now this is profound for us and profound for the future of our business over the next five, 10 years, but it's not new at all for our industry. And when Hollywood makes an hour of content, you know, if you go see Westworld or The Wire or, or any, any TV or, or, or movie production, 
you can, they create an hour of content, you consume an hour of content. And it's very unlikely that you're going to consume that, that hour of content a second or a third or fourth time. But when Nexon or a company like us makes an hour of new content, it could result in many hours of gameplay as a result of, of that new content. When you go into a virtual world, you'll play it once, you'll come back, you'll play it a different way, you'll play the same map uh, many, many times with a different group of friends, with leveled up weapons. Um, you'll want to play it in a different way. So we have what we call in the industry content leverage. And this is a point that's often lost when we talk about why game companies are so much more profitable than linear entertainment companies. It's a very, it, it sounds like a subtle point, but it's a very important point. The idea that one hour of content can translate into many hours of content consumption. Okay, so we are big believers that there is a massive under-recognized secular shift to interactive entertainment uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, and over the course of the 21st century, from linear in entertainment of the 20th century to this new form of interactive uh, online virtual worlds. And we think the 21st century, the next starting with it, or already in place and throughout the next foreseeable future is about the virtual. We think COVID is both accelerating this shift and it's making this shift abundantly clear, a lot more acute right before our eyes. And we think the world's going to look back at this time, the first half of 2020, and they're going to see it as a major turning point in the entertainment industry. So the question is, what are we doing at Nexon about all this? Um, the first is that we're focusing just on what we do best, which is deeply immersive virtual worlds. Now, like a lot of other game companies, we, um, we experiment in a lot of different areas. And I've got a graph here that if you've, if you followed us and you've seen uh, our Q1, earnings presentation, or if you've seen our Q4 earnings presentation, this is, we put this graph up. On the y-axis here, we have um, the depth of the game. So up at the top are deeply immersive worlds, and at the bottom are casual games. And on the left-hand side of the graphic is offline games, and on the right-hand side of the graphic is online games. And on the left, upper left-hand corner there, those are the games that I grew up playing, um, on mostly on PCs and then on consoles. Those are games like Civilization and SimCity. And I love those games, but they were essentially single player games. And then in the mid nineties, the internet came onto the scene and it was great. And uh, a lot of Western companies had a real challenge trying to figure out how the internet was gonna change their business like ha had happened in the rest of the entertainment industry. Uh, it was really the Asian companies and in particular Korea and in particular Nexon that embraced um, uh, this new technology and unlocked it and created whole, wholly new types of games. As I said, the, the first graphic massively multiplayer online game was a Korean company and it came from Nexon's founders. It was called Kingdom of the Winds and it's still in operation today. And then after the internet, uh, about 12 years ago or so, the iPhone came onto the scene and Facebook came on and that unlocked the casual games business. And, um, and so that's the bottom half of the graphic here. Now, Nexon has done many different things and we've experimented in all four quadrants, but what we really realized is we can't do it all. And our hearts are really in the upper right-hand quadrant. And oh, by the way, we think the upper right-hand quadrant of deeply immersive online games is really where the growth is gonna be in the industry going forward, because now we can play a very deeply immersive game on a mobile device. We've done this before with MapleStory, which has been growing very, very quickly. Uh, we are about to introduce um, Dungeon Fighter Mobile and more and more of our games are gonna be uh, cross-platform as I'll talk about in this slide. Focusing on that upper right-hand quadrant that I talked about in the last, uh, in the last slide, um, enables us or frees us to focus on what we consider to be the center of the media universe in the coming uh, 10 to, uh, uh, in the coming decades. And that means four things for us. First, we're focused on fully online multiplayer games. So for example, we, we sold off our Gloop subsidiary. Uh, Gloop is a group of terrific game developers, but they were doing more and more story-driven games, and we wanted to do deeply immersive online games on mobile devices. And so we, although they're very talented, we said goodbye to them, we sold off that subsidiary. And we made a lot of hard choices in the second half of last year um, to say goodbye to several other projects that we had going on around the world, just so we could focus in this area. Second, we are of the belief that uh, the kinds of games that we make are, um, 
are now available and now really uh, workable on multiple different platforms. Really what you're doing is you're looking at a, an immersive world that is rendered in the cloud and each of these different devices is a, is a window into that world. So someone like me, I, I grew up playing on PCs. So I love playing games on my PC. My kids like playing games mostly on their mobile phones. They prefer it that way. And some people prefer consoles. So we should just be where our customers are, whatever window into that virtual world they wanna have, we should be there. Third, um, we took a very hard look at what we were doing in terms of development. We had been working with companies like Disney and Lego. These are all great companies with great intellectual property, but we, uh, again, recognizing that we, we can't do it all and we need to focus, we decided that we really need to focus on our intellectual property because it's some of the most powerful and large intellectual property in the entire global entertainment industry. So we're really focused on, on these great franchises. And then we will make certain bets on highly unique and really promising intellectual property. And that drove our Embark acquisition uh, last year. So, uh, and the mo more we focus, the better it goes for us. Nexon has several of the biggest franchises in the, in the entertainment industry, as I, as I mentioned. Maple Story is one of them. Um, most of our investor base has a really hard, under, under, hard time understanding um, a phenomenon that is big in, the, in Asia, but it is not that big in the West. But make mo no mistake, Maple Story is a massive Disney scale franchise. The franchise started 17 years ago in 2003. We just had our 17th uh, uh, birthday or 17th anniversary. Um, and uh, it's had an amazing and now accelerating trajectory up. In Q1, it grew 132% year over year, um, which as far as we know is unheard of. A game that's 17 years old and grew 132% year over year. And by the way, that's after a string of double and triple digit growth rates. Um, uh, over the course of the last several quarters, um, or a couple years now. Um, if, I sh if I showed you the most recent quarter, it would make that line go up even more steeply that's in the lower left-hand uh, quadrant there. But what's really interesting is we introduced MapleStory M, the mobile version of MapleStory in 2006. And, uh, excuse me, 2016. And as you can see, MapleStory M is accelerating up. That's great by itself, but at the same time, the PC version of MapleStory is, is accelerating up. So I mention this because we get a lot of questions about products that, um, that we're going to introduce, for example, Dungeon Fighter Mobile, and people say, well, do you expect cannibalization? And then we oftentimes will refer back to this slide. The answer is we don't really know if there will be cannibalization, but we actually don't think there will be. Uh, we think what it really does is the mobile version unlocks a whole new group of players. And again, like me, there's some people who prefer to play on a PC and there's some people who prefer to play on a mobile. Currently we can't access that group of people who want to play on, on mobile device, but they do want to play a deeply immersive world. So we think uh, this bodes well for the future of the other games that we introduce. And that leads me to Dungeon and Fighter. Um, you know, DNF, is a massive intellectual property. It's massive revenues and it's, it's massive in terms of active users. In life to date revenue terms, it's bigger, as I mentioned, by far than Star Wars. It's over $15 billion life to date uh, gross revenues. And um, that puts it in the league of the very largest video game franchises. We think it's number one, two or three among all video game franchises. We're not quite sure about the actual numbers for Grand Theft Auto. We're not quite sure about the numbers for Call of Duty in terms of life to date. Uh, we only know what the, what the analyst estimates are, um, but that would definitely make us one, two, or three based off of what they're telling us. So it's a massive franchise, and we think its best days are certainly ahead of it. Um, meantime, FIFA Online uh, in Korea is doing great. It grew significantly in Q1, and it's bigger than it's ever been. And Sudden Attack. Um, is also doing very well. It's our first person shooter franchise. In Q1, it grew 52% year over year and in, uh, it achieved the number two ranking Korean PC Cafe, uh, beating out even Overwatch. Uh, now, the key point of all these is to, to understand is about longevity. Again, this is, this is like a virtual theme park. It's like Disneyland. It's possible to keep growing your game for years or decades. Except that unlike a, a, theme, a physical theme park like Disneyland, 
Um, our business doesn't rely on thousands of people getting in close proximity to each other. Our customers and our teams, our employees, can do this anywhere, at any time, at any distance. And our next big beat, when we talk, start talking about our pipeline, our next big beat is the mobile version of Dungeon Fighter, which we plan to launch in the summer. Um, we've been working really hard to polish the gameplay and to make sure that the network works well, the network code works well in China and other markets, and to make sure there's a lot of content at launch. We're really excited. The pre-registration uh, is well over 40 million at this point. The user feedback has been fantastic. So we think the, the launch of this franchise is going to take, or the launch of the mobile version of Dungeon Fighter is going to take the overall franchise to a whole new level. So we're, we, we are very, very excited. And we have two more big IP launches coming up um, in the next little bit. The first is the, is the sequel to Kart Rider, our kart, race, our kart racing franchise that has been played by a whole lot of people. Now, when people think about kart racing, they think about Mario Kart, and Mario Kart is clearly the gold standard in the category. Over 100 million more people than have played Mario Kart have played Kart Rider. So it's quite substantially a bigger franchise in terms of number of people who have played the game than, than what most people in the West consider the gold standard. Um, but it's going to have several distinct features um, that make it us very excited about it. One is that it's multi-platform. That's a very big deal. And cross-play and cross-regional. The second is that it's free. And, uh, it's, and then the third is that it's built from the ground up to be online only. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, playing a game like Kart Rider sparks, tends to spark a lot of competition between players and, um, and getting great matchmaking is an important aspect of online gameplay among many, many others. So we've put, got a lot of features in there that make it really work well across a broad variety of devices in a network environment. And it's designed from the ground up to be that way. And then there's the first game from Embark. Um, last year, we got together with one of the most revered Western development teams so that, uh, and the idea was that we could combine their AAA um, uh, capability, their, their, their commercial sensibility and their capability of building very, very successful AAA games with our knowledge and technology and making an online game last and grow forever. And their product is still under wraps, so my marketing team doesn't want me to talk about it too publicly. But um, we're really excited about what they're producing, not only from a gameplay perspective, but also from a technology perspective that enables better gameplay. And we are extremely excited about it. And you'll hear us talking a lot more about it in Q4 of this year. And then uh, our balance sheet. Our balance sheet for us is like a fortress. Our goal has always to been to build a house, like a business that lasts in any weather, not just in sunny days. And we frankly don't have any particular insights about the broader economy and how the capital markets are, play, are, are gonna play off. But our belief is that nobody else really does either. And the point is that we don't wanna have to be able to predict the future accurately in order to have a terrific business. Our thinking on the topic means that we have a balance sheet that is not hollowed out. We don't have to ask the markets for money when we want to do M&A. We don't have to think about laying off employees. Instead, we can think about how we accelerate our business in times like this. And we think that this is the right way to run a company. And we also think it's important um, because we don't know, um, uh, we, we do know our seg the segment of our industry, this segment of deeply immersive online games and virtual worlds. We know this very, very well, and we can move very quickly when we need to. And the cash and the speed that we can move means we can compete for great opportunities with companies that have much larger cash positions like Google or Microsoft or Apple and Amazon, all who deeply want to enter and expand their online games businesses. So I'm gonna conclude uh, by tying this all together and I'll return to Daniel Kahneman. As you recall, one of his key warnings was about recency bias. So the question is what would his lens be if he was looking at games? My sense is that he'd say it would be a very bad mistake to assume that the dominant entertainment companies of 10 years ago are gonna be in any way similar to the dominant entertainment companies 10 years from now. 
And the reason is because the ways we entertain ourselves when we were kids is very different than the ways we entertain ourselves in the future. For all sorts of reasons, the change is on an exponential curve, and so it's accelerating. We think that deep online worlds, the kinds that Nexon makes, is going to be the future. And uh, it may have been hard to discern over the last few decades. It may start slowly, but then it accelerates, and it's accelerating very rapidly right now. And we are positioning ourselves to be the leader in this space. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time.